So Tyson Yuncaporto, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hey, how you doing? Um, yeah, let's let's get planted. <laughs> yeah. So um, I want to do a little bit of background, not assuming that everyone's listened to the last one that we did with uh, with Glenn Murphy or or read your book. But ba basically, you've written this book, Sam Talk, that kind of showed me that a lot of my assumptions about the world are really assumptions about a very limited experience of, of civilization, of a culture, and it's not mm. universal. And since, since we talked last time, and I keep coming up with more and more examples that I think, I think this is one, and I think this is one too, but you have sort of like a, a general, like a grounding of the difference between, you know, uh, you, your book is subtitled How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World, like a basic fundamental difference between indigenous thinking and what I have grown up on. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I guess just time. It, it's funny, like, uh, I think if you're using really genuinely using indigenous thinking that you're embedded in, um, the word indigenous and the category of indigenous and non-indigenous doesn't work anymore. <laughs> You know what I mean? Um, so just, yeah, yeah that, that's one of the things that I've actually been like going in circles about is how to ask, like the, the problem isn't that I'm going to get the wrong answer, but it's that I'm asking mm. the wrong questions or I'm, yeah. the, like the question that I ask is already loaded with an assumption. That's it. And I guess I'm just making a distinction there between, I don't know, see, there's this idea of the authentic indigenous, like the native untouched, untainted. Uh, never had the flu, you know, it's that <laughs> idea, like as if that exists anywhere on the planet anymore, maybe a couple of places. Um, but if, if so, not for long, you know, and then there's, you know, um, the native, the, 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 the colonized and in the process of decolonizing kind of native, you know what I mean? So for a lot of people, you know, being indigenous is about, uh, being of indigenous descent and, um, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, inhabiting that group identity and sort of, you know, moving towards these ideas of decolonization, uh, if not actually physically, you know, into a separate nation, which is usually what happens. You know, we just end up replicating these settler structures of nations when we separate. Um, if not like that, then just, you know, your self work inside your deco, you're getting the colony out of your system or whatever. Um, it's a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing. Uh, but, but, you know, like, I don't know, to actually really deeply inhabit, you know, what people are calling indigeneity and all the rest of it, you find that all these terms lose meaning for you. Mm -hmm. Like they just fall by the wayside because I mean, they're, they're looking at, very different timeframes, different timelines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for me, you know, the indigenous knowledge isn't in the, isn't, it's not in the, the history and the stories and the, the, um, the tragedies and, and all that sort of thing. Like that's something that we have to deal with, you know, that's true. However, like it, it's, it's in the processes and ways of thinking, ways of knowing that have survived everything, you know, that we're all carrying, um, that's what I, I find really exciting because those things are resilient and they survive all kinds of cataclysms. And I guess the world's facing some cataclysms at the moment. So it's those robust and resilient, um, you know, like meta structures of culture, which are going to be important uh, to carry forward. Mm -hmm. So we need to pay attention to them. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think about like, um, like, you know, there's something like very romantic about, okay, let's like, I would love to go live in a stone age village. Right. And just, right. But that's not, that's not realistic. That's not going to yeah. save us. We're not, you know, humanity is not going to make that choice, nor do I think that that's a very indigenous way of thinking like, Hey, let's just, you know, reverse the clock and go back to, mm. to that. But I'm also thinking, like I I read some books by um, I guess a Mayan shaman, Martin Prestel, who talked about like the Mayans could have invented computers, but it co it cost too much. Like they understood yeah. that. <laughs> uh, isn't that like lovely? You know, like 
how how like I'm trying to figure out how can I I do see all that chip circuitry in their in their artwork, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, keep going now. Yeah, like how you know, how do I how do I approach you know the sustainable ways of that indigenous ways of knowing have while I'm surrounded by electric lights, by particle board, by computers. Like is the, like is there a way to, you know, I'm 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 thinking about this in terms of like the pa the pure past, mm. Mm. and the the messy like extractive future. Like is there a non extractive yeah. way to look? Go. Uh, here's the thing, um, you know, and and th this is what being indigenous is for for one of a better word. The thing that everybody's looking for, basically, you know, I call it human because we're all born in that way. We're all born indigenous. It just we have to be industrialized and domesticated over about eight years. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so that way that undomesticated, that might be a better word. That way, if we're being the species that we're supposed to be and occupying our ecological niche, you know, which is the custodial species niche. If we're doing that, then what we're doing is we're adapting to our context and we're responding to our context, whatever the hell it is. You find yourself in a gulag, that's your context and you're responding to it. You know, you find yourself in bloody Silicon Valley, then you're there and you're working with that. And, and just that's what we do. So wherever we are now, that's what we have to respond to. It doesn't mean we have to support any destructive systems that are continuing to destroy, but we do need to respond in real time to the real things that are going on. Look, there's this idea about, um, there's this false division of sort of natural and synthetic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my old people keep slapping me for doing that because they keep going, <laughs> no, you know, um, you know, polymer resins have dreaming too, kind of thing. Um, you know, computer chips have a dreaming too. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah, they do, you know, but, <laughs> Um, anyway, so everything that's in creation, good or bad, is part of creation. Yes, that's true. But, you know, under the patterns of custodial relations that we have, I've come to understand that there are combinations of things. And I guess we can get into this with diet soon, because that's what we really need to be talking about today is diet. Like, I felt like that's well, where you wanted I to wanna, go. I wanted, to, I wanted there are, to explore that as a... I mean, as as a sort of a case study of this mm. larger issue, like I don't just want to like you know debate, okay, vegan cool. or, but but like yeah, because, yeah, but because well, that means well, diet's so going to be me. a really good example of this. Beautiful. Yeah. Of okay, so so in what people are calling nature, there there are things that should be combined, and there are things that should remain separate, and and that's what the law of the land is for. And the law of the land, you know, at a basic level, a lot of people will refer to that as as natural law, mm -hmm. you know, or even the laws of physics, like they're there to tell us our limits, you know, and and if you're combining things that shouldn't be combined, then over time, the law will take the law of the land will sort you out and you will be ceased from existing. OK, so, for example, an animal species any species that is um, that is starting to do, you know, repeatedly over time, um, father daughter or mother son matings. So if they're mating parent and child, that species in, in a very short time will cease to exist because the law of the land will take care of them. That's a combinatorial that shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. That's a bit, that's too, I mean, yes, it can happen. And those child, the children that are born of that union, yes, they are part of creation and they are special, lovely beings. That's true, but that shouldn't be happening. So the law of the land will take care of that, like with birth defects, etc. Over time, will destroy that line. Will destroy that uh, even that species if that species continues to do that. So you know there are things that shouldn't combine. There are elements that shouldn't combine. You know, like. <laughs> <clears throat> there's certain things you i mean you know uranium just in the ground it's all right in that form when it's in the ground when you start to combine it with other things and do weird stuff to it it goes no good you know um everything else there's certain things that you should not be you should not be messing with and combining with other elements 
right. you know there are certain uh so so all the things that have been combined together to make new elements to make your computer that's all you know the natural law of that the law of the land uh, has already meted out its punishment for that like a bunch of poisons have been produced from that that are going to kill you they're in the air they're in the water and they're in the land now and they will kill you your punishment has already been set in motion from this computer that you're using because mm -hmm. it's against the law of the land anyway so yeah. that's that was that was the way i've been trying to describe it lately is this idea of uh wrong combinations of things uh -huh. yes they're part of creation and yes they exist and yes they have spirit but there's certain things that shouldn't be combined and i guess we're here as the custodial species to make sure that doesn't happen mm -hmm. so when i when i filter that through the what i think is sort of the central dictum of the book about narcissism yeah. So like, how do like, I'm trying to think like, and again, I can hear the industrial progress oriented echoes in the question is like, how do I know what's good to combine? Like human beings are inventors. We like try mm. new stuff all the time. Like, is there like, you know, like, I'll give you an example. Like there's, you know, there's CRISPR technology, these like, you know, genetically modifying genes. And we've seen yeah. a lot, you know, of, of stuff that people argue about. But I just heard recently about CRISPR technology applied to precision fermentation, that these vats where you can grow like proteins and whatever you mm. want. So and, and, and like a lot of vegans are like, yay, we can finally grow meat and we don't have to hurt animals anymore and we will never oh, wow. have we won't have any more poverty because we can also grow all the vegetables it'll be much like cheaper and perfect and we won't have to be in land and i'm listening mm. to this and part of my mind is going wow that's amazing the the part of my mind that read sand talk is like that is some dangerous shit yeah well it's it's tricky because you don't know so just look at crispr all right let's just look at that so you could look at Africa and say, man, you know, there's so much sickle cell anemia there. We've got to sort that out. We can sort it out with gene editing. Mm. We can gene edit everyone in Africa. So there's no more sickle cell. And so you do that. And then all of a sudden, all these people start dropping dead with malaria because, you know, most people carry the sickle cell as a recessive gene and that recessive gene makes you resistant to malaria you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i mean what if you just cured sickle cell and then all of a sudden millions more people are dying from malaria uh, and and then you go oh well shit what are we gonna okay we need to kill every mosquito in africa here let's um well let's just genetically modify three female mosquitoes who like you know uh will spread infertility throughout the the mosquito population and then let's let them rep you know because they are releasing genetically modified freaking mosquitoes all around the world at the moment to do all kinds of weird stuff anyway so you let them go and, and from your CRISPR, and then every mosquito in africa drops dead no more malaria it's awesome and then why are the elephants dying why are the giraffes like what the, did, did their necks look like that before that's weird you know the, it everything has a knock-on effect in complexity mm -hmm. and you know if you're not if you do not have appropriate lenses to be able to view the complex whole over time and you need to be able to view it over deep time and the knock-on effects then you shouldn't be tinkering with anything <laughs> you know it might be nice to have a glow in the dark like a chihuahua that you can read by at night <laughs> i mean the people are doing that just in their backyards now it might be nice but um I don't know. Just think about that for a bit. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so, I mean, what, 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 it's weird. What just came to my mind is there. You know, the number one series on Netflix right now, at least in the U.S., is this series called The Queen's Gambit. About oh yeah, uh, have you seen that? I, I'm in the middle of it right now. I'm loving it. Uh, okay, so like, like to me, that's like a metaphor for colonializing civilization like everything mm. everybody tries as a solution actually is the problem mm. right like the couple want to adopt and the adoption becomes a problem the mother yeah. like goes takes her for a ride that causes the problem the pills are supposed to help her and they become the, like everything that everybody tries becomes a bigger problem that they have to yeah. 
resolve it. It feels like like that's Western civilization. That's the civilization mm -hmm. that it's not like Nietzschean, like you have your your thesis and antithesis, and then you have a better synthesis. When you look at it over indigenous time, it's just like it's just getting worse and worse. Yeah. Uh, look, this um, basically the Queen's Gambit is a story of someone, someone who who's stubborn enough they refuse to allow their mind to be domesticated. That's it. <laughs> it's a girl through a series of accidents who discovered, you know, a stubborn streak in her, herself that that allowed her to, um, you know, even though it threatened her life to do so, she refused refused to let her mind be domesticated. You know, and, and that's that's it. That's all it is. And of course, it's going to destroy her. I'm not to the end yet, so don't spoil it for me. Actually, you can spoil it. I don't care. Um, but yeah, <laughs> she's probably going to die. I mean, it's <laughs> it's very difficult uh, to live in this society, you know, um, uh, with an undomesticated mind or a not completely domesticated mind in any way, uh, unless that interaction with society is mediated by some sort of drugs. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But back right. to food. I mean, I'm so I'm imagining all these sort of vegan tubes, like, you know, you've got a machine there each day that'll Star Trek up your dinner for you, and you can have whatever you want, or, or like, you know, and uh, and it's it's see, it's kind of interesting because to be vegan and not die o over a decade or two, you've got to be a you got to have a bit of a lab going like you got to be a bit of a scientist like you need to mix like just the exact amount of stuff you know oh, like 20 percent this one and you know <laughs> well, um, yeah, of well, supplements so. in order to make sure that you're actually <laughs> able to absorb those proteins and absorb all those nutrients the right way and you've got to just try and get the right kinds of medium chain fatty acids to approximate what a long chain fatty acid might do for, for your for your brain and your central nervous system and everything else like this there's, there's so many things you have to do and get the quantities just right in order to still be healthy that it's um it's a, it's a it's a lot it's it's well, it's very hard yeah. i that is not my experience at all um so in fact i find like like the pro like the solution <laughs> that I'm going for is that what I tell people how to eat is um, to eat what you, like if you were living on this land, mm. um, eat what you could get in naturally attainable quantities. Right. So like if you're going to have a cookie, like let's figure yeah. out how much wheat would you, like how much energy would you have to put into collecting all the ingredients, the wheat, mm. the sugar. The th nice. And, and so like there's a, like there's a way in which a largely plant-based diet would have been what we would have eaten. Um, right. Well, I guess in, in the country where you are, the idea is um, for humans anyway, um, the idea is follow the bears. Like humans eat what the bears eat. Right. But then once we, we've already domesticated crops, yeah. Right. So now to be like when I when I look at the, the world as it is right now, to me, being mm. vegan is the mm. best option for me, for the environment. When you can when you look at where else could I get my meat from mm. factory farms, from feedlots, mm. the you know, all the food, all the grains and the, the soybeans that, that are grown for the animals as opposed to mm. for me. Um, and, and so what I can do is well, I can get. Yeah, go ahead. So sorry, man. I, I just really quick. You're, you're being, you know, indigenous to your environment. You're responding and adapting to your environment and to the food chains that are around you. It's yeah. Sorry, I, that was a thought I just had. It's like yeah, uh -huh. you, you're in that, so you're doing it, and it's working. Sorry, keep keep on, but yeah. Well, it's 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 working. My concern is that. I can take something that's working and turn it into a religion. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which means like the thing that I did when I was four years old that worked is I would skin my mm. knee and cry and get chocolate. And I could spend my whole life doing some version of that. Yeah. And like, I'm, I'm feeling like veganism is a really positive response to this environment in which I'm in, but it's not going to save, mm. it's not going to save like, like what I learned was veganism will save the world. It will save civilization. 
but it still mm. requires mm. mono huge monocrops. It's still like the like I feel like the ultimate answer is something like not having like be finding a way to get back to yep. nature. Well, it's about um okay. So so yes, we're the custodial species. So the idea, like a lot of vegans, like they're really cool about policing everybody else's food choices. Okay, so so it's like, well, that's that's how I'm a custodian of the world. I'm trying to stop the murder of all these animals who look a little bit like me. Who like when they have a baby, I would look at that baby and go, oh, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Um, but I guess here, here's the thing. What, what you're supposed to be a custodian of is your food chain, your bioregion, but your diet, you know, so what you're bringing into that bioregion, you know, for your diet or what you're extracting from that bioregion, the idea is, um, is regeneratively giving back and making sure that lasts. Now, so I guess like your, your challenge as a vegan is to figure out how do we do soybean production without biocide, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe CRISPR is one of those directions. And well, say, say more about biocide. Like what are, what are we killing? Oh, when we grow okay. Soybeans? You're killing. Okay. For a start, you're killing so many animals that look like you and with babies that you would think would were cute. Like you're killing a lot of mammals. <laughs> um, Maybe with, like, with like rabbits and mice that are in the fields that get harvested. Okay, with... yeah. Well, they're, they're the things that are in the fields now, and yes, they get they get just churned up with the rest. Um, but what about what was in the field before? Uh, before it became a soybean field, <laughs> mm -hmm. that I mean, the, the the actual just you know the eradication of that biota in order to make the dead dirt patch that you're then gonna you know, spray all your chemical fertilizers and stuff on uh, to, to and uh, to make your soybean production, you know, into this sponge of dead dirt. I mean, not to mention just the the bio side of the earth itself, like the the soil, like a teaspoon of soil, as you know, contains so much life, like more diversity of life in one healthy teaspoon of soil. And you'll find in any, you know, in a, in probably the whole rest of your your community you know what i mean it's just incredible um what's in dirt so to kill that dirt is just is the most horrendous thing it's an act of self-termination you know for your own species let alone all the things you're killing in there but the land that had to be cleared and the ecosystem that had to be disrupted in order to even just make that soy field it's so much more than the, you know, billions of animals and insects and everything else and marsupials, uh, not marsupials where you are, are, mammals, everything else that just gets destroyed with the harvest and the planting and the uh, clearing of the weeds, etc. like every season. It's so much more than that, what has been destroyed. And it's so much more than that, just that massive soy field that's blocking flows from one natural system to the next. You know, all those little mice and rodents and stuff that are going through at, you know, they're trying and, and the reptiles and everything else, they're trying to get from one island of um of of sort of what's left a remnant bit of natural land. They're trying to get from that island to the next one on the other side of your soy field. You know, because eco things move in ecosystems and these things need to be connected at least with corridors if you're gonna have these ridiculous bloody um you know, big monocrops like that. Um, but also what you're doing to the soy itself in domesticating that plant and only selecting the biggest, brightest, most protein bearing seeds, you, you're killing, you're dooming that plant species to death because you're not supposed to do that. You know, you have to select the withered seeds as well some of them to go in because you know like a tiny little seed that's actually no good for food to eat you know out of your soybean that has to go into the genetic profile as well because that'll be carrying something else that might be resistance to a, resistant to a locust plague down the track you know what i mean if you keep select if you keep inbreeding all of these you know biggest and brightest soy seeds and god forbid gmo ones as well you know, you're basically creating this this inbred, you know, incestuous 
horrendous bloody species, which is going to wither and die. Like I said, any species that's doing parent child mating pairings is going to die out. You know, any species that is just mating like with like, like with like, like with like. In nature, it doesn't happen like that. You know, diversity is really important. Nice. Yeah. So, that's um, so you know, it's it's sorry. That's 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 only just skimming the surface. And I know I've monologued for ages, and I'm ruining the yarn because I'm talking for way too long. But it's um, but you know that that's just a a a brush on the surface of of how destructive it is. You know, so feedlots with cattle and pigs, they're incredibly destructive. Uh, but most of that destruction is 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 because uh, is because of the um the surplus grains from these mega crops that are subsidized by governance to um to produce more than we could ever eat so we're now we're, now we're forcing these animals to eat it and they don't like it the systems don't like it they're not supposed to be eating that they're supposed to be eating grass and so they're just farting and farting and farting as they sort of grow fat with their sick guts like you have to make an animal sick to make it what the marketplace wants you know and then you've got to kill it it's awful these things but you know pastoralism is probably um is probably the most sustainable bloody farming practice that we can have and food production practice that we can have pastoralism where you're moving you actually have shepherds kind of thing and you're moving flocks around on good grassland which is the best kind of carbon sink you can have by the way and those those animals grazing on that but being moved around so they're not staying in one place and wrecking it um, they're actually, they're reproducing that pasta over and over again and fertilizing it really well. And so you're moving these things around. Most of the arable land on the planet um, is not suitable for growing uh, food plants on. It's not suitable for horticulture. It's suitable for pastoralism. So we need to have these grass fed beasts being tended and moved around in the same way that um, you know, wolves and hunters and all kinds of things used to move the bison herds around on your island there on Turtle Island, you know, used to move the buffaloes around and that would shape the landscape and keep it reproducing. You right. know, prairies, I think it's 97% of your prairies are gone and dead. These need to come back. They're going to collect more carbon than the Amazon will ever collect. Just your prairies, just if you brought back 20% of them. You know, these are important and that's what should be where the soy and the corn and everything else is being grown, you know, most of which is being destroyed to make artificial bloody scarcity so that it's worth something in the market, but constantly being subsidized. So we're producing more and more and more. And it's like, God, what else can we get out of this corn? Ah, stuff at corn syrup. Nobody wants corn syrup. It makes them feel sick. Stuff it. Just put it in the tin of beans. Put some corn syrup in their beans. Put it in everything. Uh, put it in the paint. We'll, we'll put, I mean, <laughs> soy is is so toxic. Like like the 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 toxic waste that comes out of having to refine soy to make it edible. You know, <laughs> and to turn it into tofu. The stuff the stuff that comes out of it. You know, uh, it used to go into paint. They used to put it into paint. <laughs> Yeah. and well, now they, they I, put it yeah. into into food they put it into our like protein bars uh, <laughs> it's just like it's awful and for a man it's worse because it's it it, it messes with your estrogen you know and it's terrible uh, especially so if you're someone like me you know eating a lot of soy and having two young babies because when you've got young babies and you're a man and you're not just a prick who just goes away and forgets about them uh, if you're actually looking after those babies, your estrogen levels like go right up and you put on heaps of weight and you start crying a lot. <laughs> but, um, you know, soy does that to you as well. And it really messes with you as a man. So you've got to be careful with that soy. Well, you know, I'm, uh, there, you know, there's plenty of science in my head, you know, about, you know, sort of studies of the difference between like, estrogen from cow's milk and soy. So, you know, I'll have a lot of listeners saying, you know, why didn't you tell them about this? The studies that show that soy is yeah, a, yeah. a beneficial estrogen, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to argue, but I just want, I want to kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It. Actually let's, let's um, yeah, let's leave that sort of stuff out. 
I what think I, what um, I want, because what then, I then it's not a yarn. Like I, 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 like I, 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 I do want to talk to you as we go along about you know indigenous diets and how they they work. You know, on our, on our continent. And I have I've spoken to Native Americans who talk about yes, you follow the bears, you know, and you know because what the bears eat is what humans are supposed to eat, and you know so the bears will show you that what the edible fungi are, and like this this massive diet of just you know this omnivorous diet that in the right season yeah you're having some of these salmon, and you're having some of these things, um, and you're having honey and you're having fungus and you're having greens and roots and shoots and berries and all kinds of things. Right. So, and again, you know, so living in this society in mm. which all these persistent organic pollutants um, concentrate up the food chain and get stored in fat, right? Like mm. there's like health reasons to avoid almost all animals, even like wild ones. Mm. Um, I did want to so offer a couple things for like what I, um, I had a couple conversations with a veganic farmer up in mm. Maine, who is into regenerative, and he was pointing out that if you eat tofu, you are basically supporting the pork industry. Because the reason tofu is cheap, is that all the stuff that's not all the okara gets yeah. sold to pig farms in North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. So, so like, like, the more you the more you start, like, there's a myth of veganism that I have held for mm. a long time that it's somehow pure. Mm. And it's, it's, it's sort of encapsulated, and it, it doesn't spill out. Yeah, the, you know, um, have, have you come across the idea of the local food movement? The yeah. idea that you have a 50 kilometer radius for your food? Yeah. And some people, you know, do a challenge where they do it for a year like that. And, and then they have to they have to get very creative. And there's things they have to grow and produce themselves and all different kinds of relationships they have to make with different farmers and people and, uh, you know, networks of people growing things in their backyards in order to get everything they need i mean i think um it, you know a, a challenge would be to combine local food with veganism in that way and and i think you know because you know the the reason the only reason that veganism would be a, a sort of a destructive force in the world is is if it was relying on these big food chains but then everybody's diet is a destructive force in the in the in the world um when relying on these massive food chains um and there's something bad about that food that comes to you like that there's something that's no good about it you know like i eat a lot of meat but um i, I find the, the meat that i get you know that has there's so much meat that most of the meat now for some reason it doesn't eat grass anymore and when you eat it it's, it's just nothing there like you're eating this fat where you're expecting to get all your good things from it you know, from an indigenous point of view. And there's nothing in that fat except just, you know, carcinogens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just yeah. awful. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things I'm, I'm a little, like when you talk about like, you know, pastoralism, so certainly, you know, the, the bison in North America created the 14 feet of topsoil for prairie. Um, you know, the, the herds in Africa, cre you know, created a very l lush land. But is there a difference between that and hunting those creatures and domesticating them? Like you're, you know, like domestication yeah. of humans, domestication of soy. Like, is there a problem with like eating cows and sheep and these animals that that have had their their will to live almost mm. bred out of them? Yeah, well, I think that's I mean, there's the other Native American thing I've heard is the idea that um that wolves teach people how to be human. Hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and the wolves have quite a, a distinct role with those, with those herds, you know, that, that they don't sort of own or domesticate them, but they're, they're in relation with them and they have kind of a covenant with those herds. And I guess, you know, for humans as a custodial species, you have to have a bit of a covenant with the food, you know, and with the species that, that you're, that you're living with and from, you know, hmm. There has to be a covenant there, you know, whereby you, you're making sure that you perpetuate that species, that your relationship with them is custodial. Now, custodial, it's different from, um, from stewardship. It's different from having dominion over. The idea of capturing an animal and locking it up is just horrendous to me. Like, I hate that. I refuse, I refuse even to have pets. I hate the idea of pets. It's just awful to do that to an animal. Who would do that? It's just 
horrible. You you just yeah. I mean, it's bad enough that we're domesticated, but then that we might go on and domesticate other beings is just awful. And I guess the um. You know, if you look at in the Middle East, where like as their civilization declined, as all of their land turned into desert, you know, that was forest and pasture land before. When you read in the Bible, it was quite beautiful. <laughs> the, the lands there just a couple, just a few thousand years ago. Um, but now you, you look at it and it's all desert. So I guess, you know, as their land just got devastated by these earliest civilizations, you know, you can see that that a lot of those peoples, most of them, like return to a kind of pastoralism. Um, you know, so they had uh, flocks and herds that, that they weren't locked up, but they were just kind of there was this kind of uh, relationship, you know, with those animals, and there was this covenant of yeah, I will I will keep an eye on you throughout the day and the night, and I'll protect you from pred other predators, and you know, I'm I'm we're going to, we're going to, we're going to eat some of you over time, you know, throughout your lives and, and your life cycle is going to end up, um, you know, the idea, your life cycle, instead of just sort of dying and, and sort of being distributed around uh, throughout the ecosystem, um, that's going to be mediated by you're going to pass through my digestive system <laughs> at mm -hmm. some stage as well. So there's that kind of covenant that happens there. Um, so you're part of that food chain rather than being a sort of a master of it, funneling it all into you. And instead of distributing all the resources from that, you're just kind of, you know, um, uh, putting it into these static heaps of waste that are sort of confined in one spot or um, that, you know, are intensified and toxified and all that sort of thing. So I, I think that pastoralism was good and, and I can see you know, in the Middle East that they kind of returned to that. And then they had a kind of sustainable, you know, agriculture around these oases and around places along rivers and all that sort of thing, um, where they allowed those natural cycles of the rivers and everything else to, um, to keep sustaining, you know, the environment. And they kind of returned to that um, with a lot of the crops they were, they were growing and they had trade, you know, with other places. And so they were able to live quite well. Um, you know, as they kind of um, allowed their civilization to wind down, and they were kind of in an act in in a in a phase of transition uh, back to becoming fully human again in the Middle East, uh, mm -hmm. back to a kind of indigeneity um, until Anglo Oil arrived, and you know that that company Anglo Oil <laughs> um, arrived, and then they sort of changed everything back again. So you ended up with these you know, weird transitioning sort of feudal, um, mm -hmm. you know, monarchies ended up sort of, you know, getting this artificial injection of wealth and, and, you know, so that, that, that got weird there. Um, yeah. yeah. You, you find that all around the world people. So, you know, you, you're in the jungle, you're in the Amazon and you're finding ruins of civilizations that <laughs> were trialed as an experiment and then just fell. You know, you go to Zimbabwe and you see some of the oldest ruins in the world that nobody's quite sure how it got there. And archaeologists go, well, we're just not going to look at that. We're just going to assume that white people were in Africa at some stage. <laughs> but, you know, all these places, you know, civilization has been an experiment over the last 10 to 15,000 years. And these things have risen and fallen and people have returned back to sustainable, you know, ways of living. Um, with their environment, with a vast range of different diets. Yeah, so it's, it seems like like being in a covenantal relationship with with a species, whether it's animal or plant, mm. takes a lot of consciousness and a lot mm. of thought. So when I, you know, when in my romanticized view of native peoples, they're like you know talking to the spirit of the deer and doing and having ceremonies to thank, you know, and the, and the corn is the, and the squash and the beans are sisters. And it's very, you know, it's very animistic. Mm. And it's one of the things that I loved about Sam talk is like, you're, you're, you're trying to get through my head that rocks are in, I can be in relation with rocks and I need to be in relation with rocks. And there's, there's a, form, there's a form of like equality mm. that maybe is the flip side of the, the narcissism, the like, 
as, like, as long as the, the people are equal and have equal access to resources and equal, equal opportunities and equal mm. status, that I don't have a bunch of people working for me, it seems yep. like that's sort of the basis for an indigenous way of, of being covenantal with, the, yeah. with, your, with your ecosystem. Yeah, that's it. And, and, and these things, they're not just ceremonies and rituals to try and make sense of the world. They're, they're actually supposed to bring your way of life into alignment with the natural system and to, to guide your sort of holistic understanding of any interventions you do in that system so that they don't have bad knock-on effects. You know, so, um, so we have, uh, like in Australia, we've been trading uh, with Asia since long before our European invasion here. Uh, there was there was trade with Asia, so we have like um, you know, but before anything's introduced, you know, animals, plants, anything like this, this this takes a very long time of sitting down and understanding the foundational story, the pattern, you know, almost the DNA of that species. Like you really need to understand the pattern of that, and to have the right metaphors to describe that, and figure out how that will come into the system without disrupting it too much. You know, so for example, have you do you eat much tamarind? Have you come uh -huh. across tamarind? Uh, oh, yeah, I yeah, get the, tamarind, the, the paste in like the Indian grocery yeah, store. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that Indian food there. Well, we had uh, we've got um, as a native plant now. We have uh, right across the north in Australia we have tamarind, but that was only introduced like you know maybe a thousand years ago. Mm. You know, in, into our ecosystem, and it took time. And there are song cycles for that. So there is ceremony for that plant, you know, because that's been brought in. And, and that's kind of like the, um, <sighs> you know, it, it's, it's like what you have uh, big sort of management texts, land management texts and, and biology sort of chapters around these sort of things. It's like that. And it's about understanding how to manage that and where, where they're supposed to be and how they're supposed to interact with and fit into everything else. You know, so there is there is ceremony for that plant. Uh, there's ceremony and song cycles for tobacco. You know, um, for not just the native tobaccos that have always been here, but the ones that have been introduced uh, from Asia through that trade. Uh, song cycles for different forms of agriculture uh, that came down from New Guinea, which is like the oldest agriculture on the planet there in New Guinea. They know how to do it right in that environment. <laughs> But some of that uh, came down into the north of Australia. Lots of different, um, you know, uh, plants and technologies and all these things. These get introduced, and they come in with a dreaming, and they come in with a, you know, correct usage way, and they become people become responsible for those as totems. You know, so one of my family totems is the dog. And the dog, of course, was intro introduced, but there is a story place with a dreaming you know, for dogs in my community. There's song and there's dance and there's very sacred sculptures that we do for dogs mm -hmm. uh, in my community. And that's that's one of my my family's totemic sort of responsibility is, you know, <laughs> and we end up with these dogs that are like, they're like sacred cows almost, you know, the way those cows wander around in, in sort of vegetarian communities in India and, um, you know, they don't, you're not allowed to mess with them. You know, we've got in my community, dogs are like that. <laughs> you know, they're, they're a really sacred sort of animal. So, you know, this is how these things, um, these things happen. And I guess, you know, a, as a vegan, like one of your roles is to figure out, well, what's, what's my relation with soy? And what's my responsibility to soy? This soy mm -hmm. is keeping me alive. I have a covenant with that soy. How, how do I become responsible for the continuation of that species and to maintain the diversity of it? And um, I, I think if you're, if you're eating a lot of soy, you should probably be growing a, a few soy plants in, in your garden, not mm. just not for production, but just a few soy plants mixed in with everything else, just so you can talk to that plant uh, <sighs> and sort of be with that plant and understand it and allow it to, um, you know, cross pollinate with other sort of, you know, diverse soy plants and allow it to just, you know, evolve there in your garden and to evolve alongside it. Um, you know, and, and you come into relation with that plant and you make a connection with it. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, I feel good. Cause we, yeah, we grew like 
50 or 60 soy plants and they they gave us maybe like you know four cups of edamame but, uh... <laughs> which is delicious when <laughs> when salted yeah <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but and it's not, and it's it's almost not about that that production with with the food. It's about, you, I mean, it's obviously you're not doing it for the four cups of edamame. Right, you know, you're doing it to come into yeah. relation with that plant and understand it. Um, yeah, you know, it's and, funny. And, we, we grow we grow all these different kinds of beans, and they're beautiful. Different, you know, yeah. like a bean, a variety, like they're you know red ones with scarlet things and orange ones. And, oh yeah, and we would bring in this basket and. Like we would, you know, like the whole kitchen is now a complete mess. Like it's impossible to do anything in the kitchen. We then have to move everything into the dining room when we're shelling them. And like my son comes in, he's, you know, 21. And he, and he's like, you know, you could have, like, you, he sees us, like my wife and I will spend like four hours on a Saturday shelling beans. And we end up with, he's like, you know, that's like a dollar's worth of beans <laughs> at the supermarket. Like, what the hell are you doing? And yeah. Like to me, the answer is so obvious, but I don't know exactly. I didn't, I think you've helped yeah. me put it in words. Yeah. Like, why am I doing that? You're doing a lot of work for, I mean, it's more than, than what the energy you're getting from that plant, but that's the thing you're, you're trying to give back. You're trying to be in a reciprocal relation with those plants. And um, you, you just, I mean, as, as a, as an organism, that's part of your patterning and that's what you have to do. And um, that's really exciting to me. Mm. It's beautiful. Well, I'm so happy about that. And I, yeah, and I love how you're framing it because, like, I'm I'm coming in. I came in for a long time thinking that veganism was the solution. Mm. And while I don't think it's the problem, I don't think it's the solution because it's like it's built on assumptions of this civilization, which is self, which is self terminating. Mm. Um, what, I, what, I, what I wanted to ask you about, I, and I, this might be a totally off topic thing, but I'm gonna, I, you know, I was inspired by your self reflection about your yarns, like the ones that went well, it's just like, don't sell, don't second guess or self doubt. I, I want to ask you about um, the idea of orphan and I can and I hear as I hear myself say it I know there's you know there's things you allude to about your life in the book which I'm like sensitive about but like that just occurred to me right now honestly like mm. I was thinking like the central literary metaphor of my civilization is the orphan story yeah and it occurred to me for the first we time come back reading, to we come yeah. back to the queen's the queen's gambit <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Yeah. But that like, like that's our, the central hero that we all identify with in the West is the orphan from Harry Potter to Beth Harmon in the Queen's Gambit to just about everyone. And I was wondering, like, is that in traditional indigenous tales as well? Or is that like this idea of being yeah. orphaned? Is that just like our trauma? No, I mean, so in our culture, and, and this is only something that I, that I got to, um, that, that I got to really understand and come into in the, this, the second half of my life was this idea that there is no such thing as an orphan in our culture, because you can't be an isolated human being, you know? Um, yeah. So, so if you're finding yourself, um, you know, um, outcast or, you know, uh, cut off, you know, from your, from community in, in some way, or you're lost or anything else. Um, there's people will take you in. There's no such thing as an orphan because, you know, a, a, a child who's, who, who's lost their family or is separated from family that they, they will get new family um, straight away. And they'll be brought straight into that, that family. There's, there's no such thing as a, an unwanted child. You know, there are unwanted children in this civilization. So civilizations produce unwanted children, but mm. that's not where it begins. The true story of that is that is unwanted mothers usually, you know, so in a society that's hostile to mothers, this makes it very difficult, you know, for one mother to be able to raise a child. And I think most people uh, who are unwanted and outcast, which is a lot of mothers, 
you know, it makes it almost impossible to raise a child. So you end up with a lot of abandoned children. And then the state is supposed to take care of that. And we see what happens, like, you know, with the, um, you know, the immigration stuff where children were separated, you know, uh, recently in the United States, you know, they, they go into the system and it's been almost impossible to reunite a lot of those children with their families because they're just lost in the system now, you know? It's, it's absolutely terrifying. But we, we um, yeah, we don't have that. There's no such thing as an unwanted child or an unwanted mother, you know, um, in Indigenous societies. Mm -hmm. And is the you, basis... You, you don't have the orphan. I guess here's the thing, and to answer your question more directly, the idea of the, the reason the orphan is so attractive in the Western mythology is that it... Um, it's 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 the perfect candidate for the hero's journey and it's a very attractive narrative and i didn't realize that i was um you know looking at my own sort of in the first half of my life my own status as this kind of lost person you know this um this adrift person uh how attractive that was to me and how much i used that in curating my life story you know <laughs> as this dispossessed a drift lost person out in the world, you know, having adventures and, and fighting and being damaged and overcoming that and becoming stronger through every bit of abuse was just making me stronger and blah, blah, blah. You know, um, it's, it's an attractive narrative. I can see why people are into it, but it's, um, it's a lie. The okay. hero's journey is a lie. There's no such thing as a hero. <laughs> Tell me, tell me more about that, because I actually wrote that down next to Orphan, and I felt like like that was like the one true thing, because Joseph Campbell wrote a book about every culture has this one story of humanity, and since the reading Sand Talk, I was actually starting to say, like, I've done damage by imposing that narrative. Like, it doesn't... Again, it's, it's, it's the narrative of this civilization coming from mm. a deep lack, a deep orphaning from our land. Can you help ah. me understand? Like, tell me, tell me why the hero's journey is such bullshit. Yeah, well, uh, that's, see, that's really interesting. I'd made that connection between the orphan idea and the, I'd, I'd only made the connection as far as going, yeah, well, the orphan is attractive to that myth. But then the idea of sort of the whole culture this this dominant world culture actually um this civilization sort of orphaning itself in a way in order to 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 fit with the hero's journey mythology that's that's true you know i, I think of this uh civilization as an adolescent culture you know but mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of orphaned itself um look we all exist in profound relation You know, and we know this, you know, no man is an island, all that kind of thing. Everybody knows it. You know, we exist in profound relation, in a web of relations. And that is who you are. Your relationships are who you are. And they make you individual because no other person has exactly the same web of relations that you have. That's your universe. And it's so valuable and so precious. But it's not something that you own or that, you know, um, makes you this amazing individual at the same time. You exist in relation to that and you have obligations to that network of relations and your inputs uh, to that that uh, that web of life that you belong to are really important you know of course that's what drives you to um, do the work that you're doing with your beans and everything <laughs> else to come into relation with those plants because those relationships are not just with other humans they're with non-humans um, you know and, and everything around you yeah, I, I just I think that's a really good insight. That's why I wanted to talk to you again. Like, um, yeah, like we talked about yarns, like you mentioned before the idea of yarns and when you come into a yarn the wrong way and it doesn't work out. Um, yeah, you don't beat yourself up about it. And so that's why I contacted you and said, no, I want to have another go at a yarn because we didn't get there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but there's, there's parts of the hero's journey that I still, you know, I still find... Like, again, it's the baby in bathwater sort of thing. Like the mm. idea that there's always a call to adventure, that there's... Yeah. But the but I guess the, the primary thing is like the hero is in some sort of barren land, right? Like the yeah. queen is infertile, there's a dragon, there's some... It starts with a deficit. And the problem with it is that in order to succeed at life, you have to be a fucking hero. Yeah. Like most people I know are not heroes and... And and in in this civilization, in the Tony Robbins world, 
there's something wrong with you if you don't step up and become a hero, yeah. an entrepreneur, a CEO, a megastar. Yeah. Right. But it we're explains, so, it explains we're why. We're so vulnerable. Yeah. As, as, yeah. as an individual hero, you're so vulnerable. We're very delicate creatures and, and without community and without family, you know, we're, we're very strong together, but individually we're, we're ridiculously weak. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the idea of this impermeable hero who's out having adventures and, and just injuring himself and others and somehow dominating it's, it's a, it's a lie. It doesn't work. You know, you, you, I mean, I'm I just, I mean, I, I, what I, I, I think I, I lived that really intensely for about a decade of my life you know, being this, this lone, bloody, you know, separated individual sort of hero or anti-hero, because that's what we were raised with all those narratives from the 1970s right through till today that, you know, there's this anti-hero kind of thing, you know, um, and I was really being that and living that, but the injuries to my body, which now that I'm nearly 50, um, th those are, are becoming very apparent to me. <laughs> when you know you're you've got a knee that doesn't work and you've got ribs out of place and and you've got like you know chips and cracks and fractures and things that'll never quite heal properly you know it's like well that's where the hero's journey takes you mm -hmm. it takes you to a very shortened life and a lot of pain and and disability and all kinds of things it's there was no such thing as theseus perseus Achilles, all these people, you know, and, and there is, I mean, even Achilles, it wasn't just his heel that was vulnerable. I mean, he was probably a real man and that real man was just one big heel, <laughs> one big Achilles heel. And, and any part, like your armor is your relationships. If, if you have good solid relations that you're in a state of reciprocity with human and non-human all around you, mm. that's your armor. That's what protects you from insult and injury in the world, you know? Um, so is, is that the alternate story? Like if I give up the hero's journey, I still need narrative, right? To, to understand my life. What's, what's, what's the replacement? Yeah, well, the replacement are those stories of relatedness. And they're there, they're all there. You know? <laughs> Those stories of relatedness are there, like they're, they're out there in so many different cultures. Um, and there, and they're so, exci they're so exciting. Uh, like, I feel like, you know, heaps of them, half the stories in the Bible are stories of relatedness, you know, um, in the Quran, <laughs> in, you know, you, you pick a culture, pick a narrative, and you'll find, you know, the emergence of these, you know, hero's journey stuff, because civilization requires that. But you'll also find, you know, you'll also find um, other things as well, uh -huh. you know, and a lot of my cautionary tales as well about going the wrong way individually, bloody Cain and Abel start with that. You know, that's a cautionary tale about um, coming out of a relation. Hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't want to, um, yeah, let's not, let's not politicize the, <laughs> the oh, rejection, re the rejection of, um, of, of Cain's vegan offering <laughs> to God, etc. Um, sorry, I'm just being cheeky there. Um, yeah, but they, every culture has those stories. There, there are cautionary tales about, um, you know, being the hero and the hero's journey. And even, even the hero's journey, it, it's always ends up tragic. You know, Gilgamesh, pretty much the first one that I'm aware of, um, that doesn't end well for Gilgamesh. Hmm. You know what I mean? Um, he, he, so he, I guess that's the originating hero's journey mythology. Um, yeah. And it's, it's just not what it is. And look, the Aboriginal uh, myths and legends that Joseph, Joseph Campbell um, sort of airbrushed and mutated to fit his story. I mean, those actual initiatory um, uh, rituals and stories, that they're actually very different. They're not about a hero's journey. They're about sort of killing that idea of an individual hero and bringing that person into relation, you know, with their, with their obligations uh, to the dreaming community, to the landscape. That's mm -hmm. what those 
that's what those things are for. He only took the part of, about the, the hero bit. But, <laughs> but, you know, if you follow those stories through to the end, you actually see that the idea is it's a cautionary tale against it going that way. It's not hmm. about so the, elevating that hero. So because like my understanding is the ordeal is, you know, you're going to get your foreskin cut off at the age of 13 and you can't cry or you have to survive in the wilderness. Like it does feel like a very individual, stoic, hmm. um, you know, threshold to become a grown up in your community. What am I what am I missing? Yeah, um, it's yeah, it's 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 not that. <laughs> it's it's not about that it's about it's about teaching people that tension and balance are between autonomy and relatedness because you can't be subsumed into a hive mind either we're not supposed to be doing that mm. we're supposed to be maintaining you know attention and balance between our fabulous unique individuality and our networked relation we have a a fluid you know self other boundary as human beings you know, where, you know, you are you, but at the same time, you are us, you know, and we have, I mean, even our language structures in Aboriginal languages reflect that, you know, um, and there is, there has to be a sort of a tension and constant balance between those two things. They have to be negotiated all the time. And I guess you see this in ecosystems and complexity theory, when you see that the idea of diversity in a complex system um, is, is, is not just having you know, all these, um, you know, different sort of categories of groups interacting with each other, you know, like, um, you know, Sikhs, you know, talking to, <laughs> you know, Irish over here or something like that. It's, it's, it's within those groups, the people that you are most similar to, you know, um, you need to maintain a lot of diversity. You need to maintain a lot of difference between yourself and the people you're most similar to because you see this happening in nature all the time and it's the way genetic diversity is preserved. So you see like one family of chimps has more genetic diversity um, than the entire human species. There's more genetic diversity in one family of chimps than there is in the entire human species. I mean, the idea is you do need to maintain that difference um, with yourself, but at the same time, this kind of, it's this kind of networked individualism. Mm. Uh, it's it's very hard to explain, but it doesn't sit in a binary uh, mm. like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost it's almost like the the initiation ritual is an invitation into a right way and a wrong way. Like you could mm. you could easily like pass the test by failing or something. Yeah, but the idea is is to teach you that you're not special. So you you know you put someone in, in a situation where they're very much inhabiting their special, unique individuality. And then you're, you're knocking them out of that. You're teaching them that to live in that is to die. And so you, you ritualistically kill somebody or banish somebody, you know, within that highly individualized state. And that's mm. the, the shock that makes somebody become an adult is to understand who they are individually is, is, is nothing, you know, it, it's, it's their, it's their web of relations that makes them, that makes them unique and they have obligations to that. And it's a very hard thing to step into because you've got to kill that, that idea that you've come up with through childhood, that you are special and you're the center of the universe. Hmm. Um, yeah. I can't. I can't wait for you to finish the Queen's Gambit. <laughs> so, okay, I, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but uh... I just I can't imagine it's going to end well. <laughs> <laughs> My... Yeah, <laughs> but this uh... this this, uh, this will come up in, in the last mm. episode. This this mm. issue of special and not special. Yeah. Well, look. Um, I I you know, and I guess I, I wanted to talk to you about food, mm -hmm. um, yeah. as well. And just the, the different ways of categorizing that, you know, so it, it's interesting. So a lot of things from uh, a Western point of view that are regarded as an animal product or a plant product. So I mean, we have, so, so in, in my family's language, we have, um, you know, food is broadly, you know, divided into my and min, you know, so min is your protein sort of uh, based uh, mostly animal products. Min. Mm -hmm. 
and my is your mostly your uh, you know cellulose, mm -hmm. that 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 kind of thing. So almost plant based, um, and everything's categorized into that or that, and you kind of ha you 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 have to have a fifty fifty balance between those things. So your meal, any meal will uh, ideally be half and half, half my and half mint. But if you look at something as simple as um, um, honey, so honey, honey is called at, but that's, so you put the prefix, you put either my or min in front of any animal or plant. Now, honey is called my at, so that's in the vegetable side, mm -hmm. you know, um, but then if you look uh, in other parts of the hive are classified as min, you know, so the pollen, the propolis, all that sort of thing, that's called min. Mm -hmm. So it's <laughs> and, more, it's more about a, um, a quality. Yeah. Right? Like it's yeah. sort of like I'm, I'm picturing the yin yang of, of do, you yeah, know, exactly. not, not, not binaries, but dualities. Yeah. So balance. like, you know, half the hive is, is seen as a, as, as a, like a plant-based food and half of it is seen as, as protein. You know, um, it's, 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 it's really interesting, you know, so we have that and it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of, it, there's a wrongness to, um, to just uh, going, going too far in either direction, you know, with your diet. So if somebody's just eating kangaroo or magpie goose or something like that, then that person won't live for very long. You know, there, there has to, it, it has to be a, uh, uh, there has to be a lot of variation in the diet and it also has to be seasonal. You can only eat things when they're in their peak nutritional phase in a season. So that only lasts for up to a, uh, for like a couple of months, you know, that you're eating this one particular food and then you don't eat it until that time again next year, you know, um, <laughs> and that, that's, that's how it works. And so there is, there's a different diet in uh, every season and there are, you know, up to eight seasons, you know, there's between six and eight seasons anywhere where you go in Australia and you see this all around the world, you know, this, that four seasons model was really an economic model that was imposed on, um, you know, uh, times for extraction you mm. know, of resources, you know, that, yeah. that's a civilized model of the seasons is four seasons, but there actually, there's nowhere in the world that there are just four distinct seasons. There are, you know, between six and eight, anywhere where you go in the world, hmm. you'll see those changes happen. Yeah. What's what's coming to me as you say that is coming back to the idea of hero, because you know my job is I coach people to be healthy, and in mm. this society it means doing hard things all the time. Yeah. Right. It means getting up in the morning and going for a run. Like, why the fuck would I do that? It's cold mm. outside. It means saying no to the concentrated calories at the checkout counter of everywhere yeah. and like again like this idea that like we shouldn't have to be heroes it's like what you're talking about is a civilization living willingly living within constraint where like if i can't eat a snickers bar yeah or or eat you know chicken three times a day yeah right like the like like you know, this idea of the herds, like there's um, a farmer in, in America, Joel Salatin, who has like, does his the, the, the uh, rotational grazing. And there's a guy, Alan mm. Savory in Zimbabwe, I think, who, who's trying to do like holistic management. The truth is, if, if every farmer did that, people would be eating like a pound of meat a week or yeah. a month and not yeah. four pounds a day. It's like, yeah. like, like we're so we're so opposed to constraint, like, don't like, give me choice. And yet it's, it's the constraint that, that is one of the ways that makes us domestic, undomesticated or human, as you put it. Yeah. It's so, it's so hard. I mean, I would, I mean, the, the times in my life when I've been healthy and this isn't one, you know, I've been eating small amounts of animal products, uh, high quality, <laughs> you know, like wild meat, even, even when I was eating, um, I spent a quite a period of my life living off roadkill, um, mm. <laughs> you know, when I was very destitute and, um, and I was healthier then than I am now, you know, uh, if you're having high quality animal products, you don't need very much. You can, you can um, do very well on like one meal a day and you can even skip a day, you know? Um, 
but you know at the same time the your your body is not your own you know most of your body is inhabited by other tiny beings that need to be eating that they live off that that, those vegetable products (laughs) they need it right (laughs) and you can't just be having all these cadaverines and nothing else going in because you've got to feed those little beings because they're the ones that make up most of your body weight you know (laughs) and they need that and those little beings most of them are vegetarian so (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they need to be eating that. So, you know, anyone is doing this carnival diet wrong way, you know, you, you need all of these things. Um, but, but I mean, back to the hero's journey, like you mentioned exercise. I mean, so, um, so I, I, I spent quite a bit of my life where the exercise was natural, you know? Um, so, you know, I was hunting or fishing or out walking or running on country to get somewhere or, um, you know, looking for wood, you know, over a vast area looking for exactly the right kind of wood in the right shape to carve. And then the act of carving itself, the, these, this was my exercise. That was good. Before that, I had to do in order to keep myself fit to be the hero that could fight people randomly in the street. You know, I had to train a lot. And to force yourself to do purposeless exercise, the, the only purpose is, you know, to be fit. It's this abstract, it's really hard. And you need a narrative to do that. And you need the hero's journey to force yourself to do that. Mm. You know, so I wonder what story you tell yourself when you're exercising pointlessly. So for me, um, I used to play the soundtrack of, of Conan the Barbarian in my head. And I couldn't <laughs> force myself to run 10Ks unless I was sort of the whole time going, boom, 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 and I had to do that the whole way. Just to be like, rah, <laughs> yeah. you know, That's I'm like this my, my sole lone hero in a, in a, in a toxic, in a, in a, in a hard landscape. And what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And off we go. And you have to tell yourself that story or you can't force yourself into that. It's very hard. What, what story do you yeah. tell yourself that's so more my, healthy? My, yeah. My narrative is um, human beings are not supposed to sit or yeah. like, you know they're supposed to move like we are mm. bipedal and so if i don't do five six ten miles a day i'm not being human yeah and if i want to pretend i'm a, a hunter i have to average about 10 miles you know 10 minute miles yeah get to, you know walk sprint a little bit like what would i like what, do what like, you normally do while foraging yeah, yeah. it's like and i learned this from one of my my business partner is the guy from Louisiana who used to be 400 pounds and became a, a very fit human. It's like, and he was also, he grew up hunting and fishing. Mm. He was like, what, like watching animals, like, yeah. what do I owe the world for the calories I'm taking in? Cause yeah. I get the calories I'm taking in by sitting in front of the screen and writing and talking. Yeah. But I, I, like, I haven't earned them with my body. Yeah. Like how do I yeah. earn my calories? Yeah, it's it's very difficult. I guess I mean that's where resistance training most sort of mimics what you're supposed to be doing, you know, because you're not just running ten mm. k's uh, as a human. You know, you're going you're going having bursts of speed. You're going fast, slow. You're negotiating that that with other people who are also doing diverse activities with you. Um, you know, you're stopping and and picking things up. You're carrying things, mm. maybe something heavy. You know, you're collecting things, you're bending down, standing up, you're, you're digging, you're uh, all kinds of things, you know. Um, mm. But by So far I think the there best... has to be variety, but, but it's still purposeless, you know. Man, I tried, I tried that CrossFit. I tried really hard. Because yeah. uh, when I moved to the city, I wasn't getting the natural movement that I had before, mm-hmm. you know. And I enjoyed like 15 or 20 years of it, of, of actually moving through landscapes um in the right way and then i moved to the city about three years ago and 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 i'm just i'm i'm so unhealthy and i'm so overweight now and it's very difficult because i can't inspire myself now i I just can't do the conan theme anymore it doesn't inspire me (laughs) um like i did when i was a kid you know and but now i'm like ah what do i do i mean i can't i'm finding it really hard to force myself to do exercise that doesn't do anything it just burns calories for no purpose. It's like, what am I producing? 
Um, yeah. What am I looking after? I'm not looking after any landscapes. I'm like, I mean, how could I do that in a landscape that's, you know, essentially a swamp that's been covered over with concrete? Yeah. The, the other way I think about it is that my running is some sort of a, an offering, a sacrifice, a prayer. Nice. Like this is like I was like this body was created to be optimal in a certain yeah. way and like giving it up to the universe, to creator. Mm. It's like, OK, yeah, I'm in a shitty place and I have to run on an asphalt road and I have to pick up fake things and lift them. Like when I can, you know, we have some woods, I can like, you know, chop down a, a dead tree and chop it for firewood and haul it like that feels incredible. Yeah. Uh, but the rest of the time it's like, okay, so it's really hard right now. It's, it's yeah. not, it's not, a, you know, like, it's like being vegan. It's like, yeah. it's not, it's not the natural state, but what's the best I can do? Yeah. So you're ritualizing it and you're offering that up. Yeah, that's, it's, that's, it's definitely that's great. bigger than that's me. Deadly. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. That's a, a really good, uh, I'm going to try that one. I mean, see, I've, I've located all the places where underground water is flowing under the concrete here, you know, because you and you can feel it through your feet. It's like this magnetism, you know, and it's the first thing I did when I got here was I followed where the flows of water were so I could understand where I was, mm -hmm. you know. Um, maybe I should be running those lines of energy. Maybe I should be running and walking those and um and connecting that way and that's the way i get my exercise so i'm going to try that and i'll send you an email I'll let you know how it worked out oh awesome and i'm yeah. thinking i would love to uh, i don't want to impose on you but i would love to have one more of these conversations with you and with josh the louisiana guy who, yeah. who i got to listen he, you know, he listened to sand talk and i told him that he was the most indigenous person i know like or undomesticated, I would yeah, yeah. say. Like he's he's wild in some very interesting ways. I would love to, you know, yeah, part participate in that conversation. Yeah. It's um, I, and that I know what you mean by wild, but I mean that that word's got a lot of, you know, hero's journey connotations too. Huh. <laughs> like you know, you know, the difference between Gilgamesh and Enkidu kind of thing. There's this idea of uh, wildness being unstructured and all that sort of thing. But I mean, what's interesting is, is how much restraint you have when you're living um, in, in the constraints of the law of the land, mm. you know, the, the, the limits that the land places upon you and the obligations. Once you come into relation with that land, the obligations that are on you, the immense obligations that you have to land and place. I mean, they've, they've, it's, um, it's funny that that wildness is not, is not random and chaotic. It's, it's so highly structured <laughs> and it's, it's so restrictive. It's wildness is restrictive. And mm. I think most people would not want to be harnessed uh, by wild, <laughs> wildness. <laughs> Although the, even the idea of wild is, is this kind of idea of chaotic randomness. Um, that's not what it is. It's, it's, it's law with a capital L. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but I, I know mean, but I know feels... that's what you mean when you say wild, but yeah. it's it's interesting. Yeah. Like a lot of other people's definitions of wild is very different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like when I feel that obligation, mm. I never I never feel more human than when I feel like I'm under that obligation. Yeah. When things that's become it. clear. Yeah. Like that's the it's... end of, of my orphanhood. It's like, oh. Yeah. I, I'm part of something. And it happens, yeah. you know. Rarely, and you're ritualistically all... running and connecting with that. You know, you're doing that as ceremony. Your um, your exercise is almost ceremony that's yes. bringing you into relation. Um, you know, with something that your your domestication is 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 sort of forcing you to be separate from, but you're coming back into relation with that. It's lovely. Yeah, it does feel like a rebellion against domestication to mm. run until it hurts. Yeah. Right. Because my ancestors didn't have a choice when they when they needed to forage, when they needed to, you know, and I know you talk about like the paleo time was not a time of scarcity, but yeah. it was certainly a time of effort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's effort. But then, I mean, there almost there almost wasn't enough to do in that. And that's why kind of sport and contests sort of <laughs> came about. You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. the amount of effort that people 
put into like most of your exercise as a paleolithic person uh, would have been in ceremony and dance and um and sport you know like very very vigorous sport you know it's um i mean in see the idea of moving around a landscape seasonally you're going to different areas in different seasons where things are abundant that's the idea and that's what defines a bioregion is is the area in which humans in their ecological niche are able to move around and find abundance uh, within a given territory that's what a bioregion is and that was what most of the boundaries of territories were and they're quite stable for a for a long time hundreds of thousands of years you know so you're there and you're in you're in that place on your territory in your bioregion where it's just optimal abundance in that particular season like you know you can almost close your eyes in a in a bird or bat season and just throw a stick in the air and knock something for your lunch you know and that's it right and, um, that's, and that's the experience i get at the supermarket yeah <laughs> and i mean a, a lot of your effort is going into actually looking after that country as well mm. so you know not just you know digging laboriously to find one root vegetable to eat but you're you know uh you're digging in a way that is going to reproduce that root that, that root vegetable so you're leaving part there but you might be planting others around the place in 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 that area you know so you're not just trying to extract from the land you're always trying to give back you know as much as you're taking and you're trying to you know uh propagate and regenerate all of these things and to increase uh those things and there's a lot of effort that goes into that into the management of land uh, but then into the, the, the ritual sort of ceremonies and very vigorous dances that go for like, you know, like big, um, big ceremonies that go for like eight hours where you're just flat out. You haven't got time to get a drink of water. You're, you're dancing and dancing and dancing. And, and <laughs> that is so much more vigorous mm. than what it takes to extract, you know, the, the energy that you need from the landscape. Mm. Um, you have to be putting that back in, you know? So I guess there is that idea of purposeless activity that isn't about finding nutrition. That's actually, yeah. Ritualized in the way that you say, I think that's really important. Uh, what mm. you've expressed there, mm. that exercise almost needs to be ceremony. Um, <laughs> oh, I love that. I, it's, I it's love that. It's I a form love of that. It's a form of manners. Yeah, like it's like human beings who are extractive exclusively, or it's rude. Yeah, isn't it? Well, look, now that I mean, this conversation has probably added ten years to my life. Um, so I thank <laughs> I thank you for that, because I'm going to start to um, uh, try and reimagine um, exercise as ceremony, um, because mm. I'm missing both. Like in the city, I'm missing ceremony. I'm missing exercise you know, um, that I would normally do in my relation with caring for country and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, that is, yeah. Uh, and we would also do it. We would also do it in community normally. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. running with a group or playing a game or, you know, doing chores together. Yeah. It's much more natural. Like every so often I'll go out and, you know, do yeah. something in solitude, but not, not preferably. Yeah. Well, there's the lone jogger who's like trying to, improve their personal best time or whatever or get their heart rate to a certain level but then you got groups of joggers who are kind of trying to find you know the um the aggregate kind of pace and direction and route together which um yeah that's really something too yeah yeah i was for a long time i was working on you know with my my GPS watch. Like, can I get under a 930 pace? Can I go faster? And then there's a guy who runs on my street in the morning when I run, older guy, uh, runs with a dog. I love him. And I decided, yeah. like, you know what, we're going to do 12 minute miles just so I can hang out with Gary. As opposed, like, like, that felt more important for myself and for the world yeah. than like a, a race pace. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, competition is not necessarily yeah, <laughs> the best way to go. And I guess, you know, if we see ourselves as individual in, individuals in competition for resources, 
or in competition for, you know, uh, what's the narrative about those resources and, and everything else. I, I think that's the unhealthy way to go. Um, yeah, I, I think we're, you know, we're on a path to, to rediscovering a way in this time of transition into rediscovering ways of, of, you know, moving back into a more kind of human relation um, mm. with the world around us through these things, through diet, through exercise, all of these things. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. This, is, this seems like a good place to, to wrap up for now. Beautiful. So Tyson, thank you thank, so much for yarning, you. Howie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so happy. I can't, I can't wait till uh, COVID goes away and I can go to Australia and sounds great. Learn how to carve and run and yeah. Well, you can come and see what the concrete looks like over here. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay. It was great to talk to you, Howie. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.